yeah, enough of that. Um, made new music, so I thought I'd share new music. What the hell? Anyways, uh, moving on to important things, things that matter. Uh, real business cycle model. <clears throat> this is the first of two business cycle models that we're going to be discussing throughout the uh, remainder of this course. Um, excuse me for that burp there. Um, brought to you by Mountain Dew. This stuff's delicious. Anyways, shameless plug for which I am not being paid. Um, this is the first of two business cycle models that we'll be looking at for the remainder of this course. Uh, throughout the remainder of this course now, we'll be, well, looking at business cycle models, but we'll also be applying these business cycle models to real world events, such as uh, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, when, uh, let's see, a lot of you are probably like, what, six? And the coronavirus outbreak of 2020, in which all of you were, well, one year younger than you are now. Um, so we'll be looking at a couple of things. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the research that I have produced on this topic. Uh, my you know, main field is in business cycle stuff. So we'll be looking at some of that as well. And we'll be talking about how the real business cycle model holds up and then how the next model holds up. Now the next model is really the one that we're gonna care the most about, but to really understand that model, we need to know this model first. So, well, away we go. Uh, this is the first of two dynamic general equilibrium models we'll be looking at. This was also the first one that was used for analyzing business cycles. It was developed in the 1980s uh, by a bunch of really awesome dudes, uh, namely Kitlin and Prescott in 1982. Um, it takes the neoclassical growth model, which is an augmentation of an older growth model that includes household preferences. So we've got utility maximization at the household level. So the model includes individuals. It includes the way individuals are making choices, which in terms of the development of macroeconomics, up until this point, that wasn't a thing in business cycle macroeconomics. Um, there were a bunch of ways they tried to get around this stuff, but they couldn't ever really just go, you know what, we're gonna have utility maximizing households, profit maximizing firms, and we're gonna aggregate it up and see how the whole economy works. But the real business cycle model fixed that. Now, in this model, it's gonna be a little different from what the neoclassical growth model was, and it's also gonna be a little different from what Kitlin and Prescott did in 1982 but it's to be able to get this to make sense with a lot of graphs. Namely, these graphs, some of the graphs we're gonna look at are gonna be covering money markets, money demand, money supply, and then the way that money demand and money supply interact with each other to lead to one of two curves that ultimately determine aggregate demand. <clears throat> and the real business cycle model originally did not have money in the utility function. This one does. So, well, I guess enough about that, enough about me rambling on and on. Let's talk about the assumptions of the model because, well, it's gonna be kind of important stuff. All households are identical. So if all households are identical, we really don't need to have a bunch of different households. We can just have one household. All firms are identical. Cool. Same logic holds for households as it does for firms. We don't need a bunch of firms. We can just have one firm. So we have a representative household and a representative firm we aggregate everything up from there. Now there's a government that plays a passive role in the model, basically meaning they don't do a damn thing. And there's a monetary authority that also plays a passive role in the model. Now, because we're more focused on monetary economics and how you know money affects the real economy, we're going to be a little bit more focused on the monetary authority than the fiscal authority or the government. Now, the monetary authority is going to exogenously set the money supply to be equal to money demand in each period. That's all they do. So they're not gonna use the money supply to try to influence business cycles one way or the other. There's no role for feedback in the monetary authority's function. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is if, say, the economy just takes a dump and goes into a recession. Well, in the real business cycle model, the monetary authority doesn't respond to that, right? So you can sort of think of it as with the previous lecture on rules versus discretion, if the monetary authority wasn't looking at changes in the rate of output growth and they were only looking at changes in inflation. It's kind of what would be happening here, sort of. Now, the model has perfect competition. So what that means is 
price is equal to marginal cost in each period. So for every firm, they have to set price equal to marginal cost because every other firm will just price them out of the market otherwise. So no firm has any pricing power whatsoever over the market. Now in addition to that, right, this isn't just perfect competition among firms, there's also perfect competition among households. No household has any monopsony power. This is something that's particularly important when we start thinking about the role that uh, labor supply is going to play in this model. Now, uh, prices are also perfectly flexible. So that means if there's a shock, all prices will respond immediately, leaving no room for output responses in response to any types of like nominal demand side shocks. Well, this implies monetary neutrality. Mon money supply shocks increase aggregate demand, but in this case, when prices are perfectly flexible, aggregate demand is vertical in prices, so basically just a straight line going up, there's no change in output whatsoever. So if there's a demand shock, well, the prices move up immediately, output doesn't move at all. <clears throat> Hence, monetary neutrality. <clears throat> now, the economy is driven by real shocks. One of these shocks are technology shocks. Uh, I talk about both welfare theorems. Um, if you're interested, read about the two welfare theorems of economics. Uh, what I'll say here is that both of them are satisfied, so there's no need for any stabilization policy. Ultimately, no matter what the equilibrium is, governments or any other type of regulatory authorities can't improve conditions of the equilibrium. The equilibrium is as efficient as it can possibly be, even if we're in a recession. That's something I'm going to want you to think about for a little bit, because we have this concept of Pareto efficiency, basically meaning there is an allocation of resources such that I can't make anyone better off without making someone else worse off, right? So if there's two people and I want to take from one person and give to the other, right, that person who's made better off is not going to be made, I hate putting these two words together, more better, ugh, cringe, off. It's not going to be made more better off than the other person's going to be made, like, worse off, right? It's going to cancel it itself out. I can't make anyone better off without making somebody else worse off. So in terms of a recession, that means, well, there's really no type of fiscal or monetary policy that is going to basically realign, redistribute resources in any certain way that's going to improve conditions because they're already the best they can possibly be, even when we're in a recession. So think about that one for a minute. Or don't. It's up to you. Um, but the model explains two kinds of shocks really, really well. It explains technology shocks and it explains labor supply shocks. Technology shocks are like, hey, cool, I came up with this cool new invention. Like, um, well, for me, I love guitars, so, you know, you heard me play guitar and stuff. Um, literally every guitar you've heard has been through some kind of a digital modeling preamp. Basically, normally guitars, you know, when you do like metal guitar stuff, it goes into an amplifier. They have like these physical tubes that serve as like transistors. And that's what amplifies the sound and adds a bunch of really awesome, like awesomeness to the sound. But people figured out, well, okay, digital modeling is getting really, really good these days. And so we can actually use digital modeling to mimic the sound of real tube amps. But instead of having to, you know, lug around this really heavy, super expensive tube amp, you can get, excuse me, sorry about that. You can get this digital modeling processor thing that costs just as much as one tube amp and you can literally model whatever tube amp you want. I mean, I've got like, I think two or 300 amps stored in this thing right now, and it's indistinguishable from the real thing. So when you're listening to it, you're like, oh cool, it sounds like a real guitar amp, but it's actually not, it's all digital. Um, that's a technology shock, right? Some cool new invention that makes it easier for me to produce music because now I don't have to crank my amp up, get it super loud, mic everything up. Nope, just go straight into the computer. And so that makes it easier for me to produce, it makes it cheaper for me to produce, it makes it cheaper for every musician who uses one of these things to produce. Studios are now a lot cheaper to use because you don't have to mic up all this stuff. You can just go in, plug this thing in to a computer, plug your guitar into this thing, you know, spend your time recording, boom, you're done. All right, the computer takes care of the rest. Um, that's what technology shocks do. Um, 
Another example of a technology shock would be something like the cotton gin, right? Prior to the invention of the cotton gin, you would have to separate the cotton seeds from the cotton by hand, cut your fingers up, hurt really bad. It was pretty slow. Then the cotton gin comes along. You can just put the cotton in there, pull this lever, and I think it was like these little combs that would go through and it would separate the cotton from the seeds. And you could do it really quick. It didn't hurt. And it made it much, much, much easier to basically pick the seeds out of the cotton. Therefore, you could produce a lot more cotton much more efficiently. Thus, in both the cotton case and the guitar music recording case, the cost of production fall. Therefore, the output price is also going to fall if we are in perfect competition because well, if the marginal cost of production drops because technology reduced the cost of production, well, it makes sense that if price equals marginal cost and marginal cost goes down, price also goes down. But we also can explain labor supply shocks really well in this model. Right? Labor supply shocks are, well, what we're going to be looking at very, very soon if we're going to keep up with current events because um, with the influx of migrants coming into the United States from the southern border, well, if they're going to come in and they're going to be allowed to stay, they're going to have to work. So we're going to see a massive increase in the uh, labor force, an increase in the labor force. Well, it's going to lead to an increase in output. However, it's going to suppress wages. Um, this model explains those predictions extremely well, and it doesn't explain nominal shocks. It doesn't explain demand-side shocks, right? I have some less than stellar words in how I explain that, but yeah, I can't describe it, these uh, nominal demand-side shocks for shit. Ooh, he said a bad word. So the model's just like what we saw before. I don't actually, I don't know why I said that. Well, no. Yeah, it is like what we saw before. When I went through that brief lecture on constraints and I explained like, you know, here's a DSGE model, uh, we've got a utility function, we have a constraint. Uh, there's gonna be some differences from what you saw in that brief lecture. Uh, first, this model's decentralized. So we've got more than one optimization problem. The household's not internalizing what's going on with the firm. It's happening outside of the household's maximization decision. But a household maximizes utility and a firm maximizes profit. Um, the government's that weird kid in the corner who just sits there and eats glue. That's awkward. Um, but with these players, we optimize everything separately. Now, let's talk about what's going on conceptually for just a second. This is where some of the math comes into play. Don't worry. You don't need to know a lot of it. But the agent's got a utility function that mathematically describes their preferences because we have abstract preferences, right? There's stuff that I want but I can't measure how much I want the stuff, right? I can't put how much I want the stuff to a real number, which gives us a measurement problem in economics because, well, if we're looking at utility maximization for the household side of things, but we can't measure utility, well, we're screwed, right? Um, well, this is where utility function comes in. We rank our preferences. Right? We have a preference ranking. There's certain bundles of things. Let's say we want guns and butter. There will be certain bundles of certain combinations that form bundles of guns and butter that are better than other combinations. We form a preference ranking for this. We want one thing over the other, and we want that over something else. How much doesn't matter. What the difference is between those rankings doesn't matter, but the fact that those rankings are ranked. Right? There, there's a positive, it's, it's a, what's known as invariant to a positive monotonic transformation. Right? These preference rankings, preference rankings that are better than others, are going to be higher than others. We don't care how much, we just care whether or not they're higher. Now, basically we're taking our preferences, which say if we've got you know preferences for guns and butter, we're going to have preferences defined over two dimensions, and they're going to map into one dimension. Right, so it maps Rn into R, right? It maps the real numbers over n dimensions, in this case n is 2, into R, which is just R1, right? Just the real number line. And that describes our preferences. That describes our utility. Um, so this basically allows us to quantify our preferences. And this utility function is just the mathematical structure of your preferences to map them to the real number line so that we can do math with it. Kind of cool. 
And this utility function takes things that we like and just puts a real number to them. And it's increasing in the things that we like, right? Less of these things, well, you know, it's, having some of this stuff is good, but having more is clearly better, right? That's what the utility function says. Now, in the applied macro case, this is first and foremost a function of consumption. If we consume more, we're happier. What's the functional form on this? Well, really, I guess it could be anything as long as it satisfies a certain number of conditions. Uh, however, in this case, we're just going to treat it as log consumption. It's the natural logarithm of how much we consume, right? So if I consume 10 consumer or 10 units of consumer goods this period, I take the natural log of 10, and that's what my utility is. So if consumption goes up, utility goes up because it's a positive function, right? Utility is increasing in consumption. If you were to take the first derivative of the natural log of consumption, and you would check what the sign is of that first derivative, it would be positive. But the second derivative of utility is negative. So that means utility increases, right? Because the first derivative tells us whether or not the function is increasing. The second derivative tells us the rate at which the function is increasing. What we'll see here is that utility is increasing everywhere, but it's also increasing at a decreasing rate everywhere. It's what's known as diminishing marginal utility. You probably remember that from like principles of uh, micro or maybe intermediate micro if you've taken that class. Um, if you go from consuming nothing to one unit, your utility is going to go up like a lot, but if you go from consuming a million units to a million and one units, utility increases, but by a very small amount, much smaller than how much it increased by going from zero to one. So it looks like this, right? We look at this, it is increasing everywhere, but you can see the rate of increase slows as we consume more stuff. So this household's got a utility function. And this utility function is a function of consumption, which we've already talked about, labor, which we will talk about, and real money balances, which we'll also talk about. Basically, the agent wants to consume a lot today, but they also want to consume more tomorrow, so there's like a consumption savings choice that we have to make. Now, if we want to consume, great, but if we want to save, that means we're putting off our consumption until tomorrow. But we're not just sitting on that money. We're going to invest it by buying capital and a firm, or we are going to buy bonds, right? Now we can either buy bonds from a firm, in which case it's a private bond, or we can buy public bonds from the government, right? But they'll pay some real interest rate, lowercase rt, which we've kind of seen a little bit, right? In this model here, we're gonna see kind of how it interacts with everything else. It's what we call a general equilibrium framework. But the agent wants to consume, that's awesome. They also want to save, that's also awesome. You can either consume or save. You can't put all of your income into consumption and all of it into savings, it's just your income split between those two. But the agent also has to work because they have to generate income. If you want income, right, you can't just sit on your ass and do nothing. You have to work to earn that income. It'd be great if we could sit on our ass and do nothing to earn income but then nobody would work. And if nobody works, nobody produces. If nothing gets produced, there's nothing to buy. So we hate work. I mean, that's, that's pretty obvious, right? Work sucks. I know, I hate that song. Anyways, we hate working, but we like to consume things, right? For those of you that are currently working, um, going to work sucks every day. Now, for me, going to work isn't that bad because I literally wake up and go to the dining room or my office, and I open up my work laptop, and I just start doing model validating stuff for my bank. It's kind of cool. But, you know, if I had the choice to do that or not work, I would obviously choose to not work. Like, you know, if I want to do work for work or if I want to go to Six Flags and ride roller coasters all day, yeah, you can imagine which one I'm going to do. Here's a hint. It involves riding roller coasters all day. But if I do that, well, I'm going to run out of money. I can't keep doing that. And if I run out of money, then I don't get to consume stuff. I don't get to enjoy my time off because I'm going to be stressed out about not making any money. And that's going to piss me off, right? Yeah, exactly. So 
I have to choose between how much I consume and how much I work. Now, how much I work is directly related to how much I don't work, and we'll get to that in just a second. But there's this trade-off that we face here. You can consume more stuff, but you get less leisure, right? You have to work more, right? Because if you want to consume more things, right? Like if you want really, really nice things, you have to make a lot of money. If you want to make a lot of money, you have to work a lot. Or you have to work really, really hard to get like an awesome degree that, you know, make sure you get a six-figure job when you get out. Please let me know how to get one of those. Um, and so if you're like, I want these really great things, like I want like a super fancy television, or, you know, I want a bunch of guitars and this really cool digital amp modeling thing that lets me profile a bunch of amps and just store them in this thing at like literally zero cost. It's awesome. If you want that stuff, you have to generate income. So you have to work to generate that income. But if you work a whole lot, you don't really have a lot of time to enjoy that stuff. So there's that trade-off that I'm talking about. For those of you that have seen Office Space, there's a line where the main character's next door neighbor, Lawrence, uh, is talking to him. They're asking each other, basically, you know, what would you do if you had a million dollars? And, you know, Lawrence gives a pretty gross answer. I'm not really allowed to say what that answer is. If you want to find out what it is, go watch the movie. Um, but he gives a pretty gross answer. You know, the main character, Peter, laughs about it for a minute. And then, you know, Lawrence asks him, he's like, hey, Peter, man, what would you do if you had a million dollars? And Peter sits there and thinks for a minute. He's like, you know... I would do nothing. I would sit on my ass all day and do nothing. And then Lawrence replies with what you see here. Oh, you don't need a million dollars to do nothing, man. Take a look at my cousin. He's broke. Don't do shit. And it's pretty much what's going on, right? If you want to do nothing, hold on one second. Isis. Oh, never mind. My cat Isis is behaving for once. Um... If you want to do nothing, that's great. You're just going to be broke. Um, because, well, you've got no labor income coming in your way. So if you want to be broke, that's fine. Right? You get to do nothing, but you're broke. Right? If you want to work a lot, that's great. You get all this cool stuff, but you don't have a lot of time to consume that stuff. So you have to do a balancing act. You don't want to work too much because you want to be able to have free time on your own. But at the same time, you want to be able to earn enough to be able to, you know, get this consumer stuff that you can then enjoy. Now, on top of that, right, on top of the consumption leisure trade-off thing we got here, the agent also needs to have real money balances in order to be able to consume, right? You need to have, basically, spending cash, right? You need money in your wallet. Well, for real money balances, right, as I've explained the consumption leisure stuff, I'd like to think fairly well. We'll, we'll find out on the, the next homework. But for real money balances, think of it like this. You earn labor income, right? That gets direct deposited into your account. Some of that labor income needs to be converted into actual cash, right? Because when it's just direct deposited into your account, it's just like you know, a digital number that's in there. But you want the green stuff. You want the lettuce, right? The, the mobsters used to say in the 30s, you know, there's a lot of lettuce in this. You want, you want the cash. You want the green paper money. Now, you want that money because you want to be able to buy stuff from people who, in this day and age, will assume don't take credit or debit cards. Right? Now, this kind of predates the, the heavy, heavy, heavy use of debit card stuff. So back then, the model kind of made sense in this case. Now, we kind of need to change the way we think about it because otherwise, you know, we look like we're drug dealers. Like, oh, you know... Um, I want cash so that my stuff can't be tracked. I guess it sounds like Bitcoin now, too. Um, bad jokes. But we want spending cash, and we want to be able to have a little bit of this spending cash on hand in case, well, you know, there's some exogenous shock that causes us to need to, you know, have the spending cash. You know, lose our job, rainy day fund, you know, like your, your car breaks down on the side of the road. You need to get the car towed. Well, you need to have money on hand in order to be able to pay for that stuff you're going to want to have real money balances in that case. So real money balances will add to your utility because, well, the more of that stuff you have, the safer you are, the happier you are, right? The more secure you feel, the happier you'll feel. So to explain the stuff in the model, we like to consume, 
So the more we consume, the more utility goes up. Now we don't like to work, so labor takes away from utility. So if we have to work more, we're less happy, right? The, the tagline of that movie Office Space is work sucks. This point here, we don't like to work, labor takes away from utility, work sucks. But we like holding real money balances, so that adds to utility. So two of the three inputs in our utility function increase utility. The other, the other input, the third input, labor, takes away from utility. But we want utility to be increasing in the inputs, right? It's kind of what I said earlier about you know, some of the assumptions of a utility function, right? The input needs to be increasing utility. We need goods. We don't need bads. So consumption of real money balances are fine. We don't have to worry about that. But there's an issue with labor. We'd really rather have something add to utility instead of take away from it. Now, fortunately for us, there's a trick we can use, and this trick is awesome. Now, this is a dynamic model, right? So it goes over time. Time is discrete. So for each period, right, there's a next period, right? There's period T today, T plus one tomorrow. T plus two, day after tomorrow. Garbage frickin' movie. Hated that movie. Roland Emmerich pretty much peaked when he did Stargate. Watch Stargate. Maybe watch Independence Day if you really want to. The first one from like 96 or 97, whenever the hell it came out. And then just drop everything else he's ever made. Like Day After Tomorrow. Uh, I don't know, movies like Day After Tomorrow. He does a bunch of disaster movies and they're all bad. Anyways. Time's discrete, so there's a next time period. There's a next element in a discrete set of numbers. Now we can contrast that to a continuous set of numbers. There is no next element in a continuous set, right? What do I mean by that? You're like, well, there, there should be, a, you know, if, if it's time and time goes from here until to infinity and beyond, well, there should be a next element. Well, there isn't. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're like, okay, well, t equals zero, and then I'm going to go to t equals one, I'll say, cool, uh, but there's time in between zero and one. So we divide that time by half. Well, now I've got zero and one half. Divide that by half. Zero and one fourth. Divide that by half. All right? Or not divide. Multiply by one half or divide by two. Sorry. We can do that an infinite number of times. We can divide by two an infinite number of times and we will never get to the element that is directly next to zero. So in continuous time, we'd have a little bit of an issue with this, but in discrete time, because there's a next element, well, each time period, we get to choose for that period, and there's a next period after that. So each time period, we get to figure out how much we want to work and how much we don't want to work. So every period, you either work or you don't work. So we'll call labor, you know, this fancy little cursive L, and we're going to call leisure N sub T. I'm going to call it N for, well, not doing shit. Now we've got one period, and this period split between working and not working. The sum of how much we work and the sum of how much we don't work equals the amount of time we have each period. So labor plus leisure equals one. Now you could do it, you know, labor plus leisure equals 24 for one day. Or, you know, if you want to think about the number of hours in a week, you could do that. But you can normalize it down to one because you've got one unit of time each period. And if it's normalized down to one, well, then labor, which has to be positive, and leisure also has to be positive, right? The, the sum of those two has to be equal to one. So labor is the share of one period that you spend working, and leisure is the share of that period you spend not working. And now, maybe you see where I'm going with this, maybe you don't. But if we subtract leisure from both sides, I've defined, or sorry, if we subtract labor from both sides, I can define leisure as that one time period, right, that one unit of time minus the share of that unit of time I spend working. Now, we like not working, right? And we don't like working. So if I can define not working as, well, one minus how much we work, I can plug N in to that utility function, and we're not going to set the building on fire because that's wrong. Don't set the building on fire, kids. Public service announcement from your instructor, Jeremy. Now, if we do that, well, our utility function is now a function of consumption leisure, which we like, and holding real money balances, which is awesome. And that's what this is right here. This is a utility function that goes from today 
all the way up to infinity. Well, this theta is the elasticity of substitution of leisure for consumption, right? How much do we care about leisure relative to consuming stuff, right? If theta goes up, well, we're going to need a higher wage to want to work, right? Basically, we're, we're going to care a little bit more about consumption than we are leisure. Or, no, wait. We're going to care about leisure more than we are uh, consumption. I think, no, consumption for leisure, sorry, yeah, consumption for leisure, care more about consumption for leisure. Now, gamma is the elasticity of substitution of money for consumption. If gamma goes up, we're less willing to give up consumption goods for holding real money balances, right? So it's gonna tell us how much we care about money relative to consumption, just like theta tells us how much we care about leisure relative to consumption. Now, when I say for theta, we're gonna need a higher wage rate to wanna work, in a couple of slides, you'll see what I'm talking about once we get to the labor supply equation. Now this beta is a measure of how patient we are. If beta gets close to one, we're super, super, super patient. If beta goes to zero, we're super impatient. Now in time period zero, beta is just equal to one because you know beta to the power of t, where t equals zero, anything raised to the power of zero is just one. But the next period, beta is going to be a little smaller than one. Right, think 0.9 to the power of 1. Well, that's 0.9, right? Well, then 0.9 squared, that's going to be smaller than 0 0.9. 0 0.9 cubed is smaller than 0.9 squared, <clears throat> so on and so forth. So it weights how much we care about future periods relative to today. If beta is 0.9, I care about tomorrow 90% as much as I care about today. So it allows us to discount the future in a fairly mathematically consistent way where these things are still additively separable. Okay, time for the constraint. Now, this guy's ugly. There's no production explicitly in this constraint like there was in the example that you saw. Um, but we can go through the constraint. Basically, the constraint is just y equals c plus i. It's a resource constraint, right? Output or income is equal to consumption plus investment. Think about what that looks like for just one second, right? Or maybe more than a second. I'll give you 20 seconds to think about what that is. I have no idea if that was 20 seconds. <clears throat> I actually wasn't keeping count, shame on me. And I was having a drink of water and pet one of my cats because he's awesome. Well, this y equals c plus i, that's basically GDP. If we assume there's no government, <clears throat> output is equal to consumption plus investment. Now, this model also has government, but there's like transfers net of taxes, and in equilibrium, we solve everything out, it sort of reduces to zero, cancels itself out in a way, and we just get y equals consumption plus investment. Consumption is how much we consume, investment is how much we save. So consumption plus savings equals our income each period. But investment, or savings, is intertemporal. It's linked between today and tomorrow. So if I want to invest, right, I'm buying stuff for tomorrow, which then increases output tomorrow, output goes up tomorrow, income goes up tomorrow, consumption and investment both go up tomorrow. Penny saved is a penny earned, basically. This is my resource constraint. Now, the constraint is this, and you're probably going like, what in the hell is he showing me? Well, basically, you got consumption plus the capital tomorrow that I buy, minus capital that existed today, but capital that existed today was actually bought yesterday because, well, I'm buying capital that will exist tomorrow, but because it will exist tomorrow, it will be put to use tomorrow, it won't be put to use today, right? If you run a restaurant and you want to buy a fancy new grill, you're not getting that grill today. Probably not even going to get it tomorrow, right? But whatever this period is that you want to think about, whatever the time indexing is, if it's a month, 
you get the grill next month. It leads to an increase in production next month, but it doesn't lead to an increase in production this month because you don't have the grill. The grill doesn't exist. It's got to be built and then shipped over to you. But over time, that grill falls apart. You know, if it's a flat top, well, as everybody's scraping gunk off of it at the end of every night, that's going to screw up the flat top. Um, you know, the, the gas lines to it are going to get messed up. Stuff gets clogged. There's grease everywhere. It's disgusting. You're going to have stuff that falls apart that you need to replace. That's what this is telling me right here. We've got bonds tomorrow that are discounted to be basically a function of what they're worth today. And I've got tomorrow's money being weighted by one plus the inflation rate, which again discounts it to what it's basically worth to us today. Everything on the left hand side here is the use of funds. Everything on the right hand side is the source of funds. The right hand side is how we generate income or funds. The left hand side is what we do with it. We can consume, we can invest in firms, we can buy bonds that pay off tomorrow, or we can hold money. So this constraint requires the source of funds is equal to the use of funds. Now the only thing that's different in this case than a constraint from like what you'd see in intermediate micro is that this constraint allows us to borrow from the future. All right? If I want to borrow from tomorrow, <laughs> kind of rhymes. If I want to borrow from the future, right, I get to consume more today, but that means I get to consume less tomorrow, right? Think student loans. You're borrowing from your future self because once you get out of school, you got to pay those student loans back. So you don't get to enjoy that full range of your income because you're busy paying back your student loans. That's what a dynamic budget constraint is going to give us. Now we're going to do optimization here with four choice variables, capital, leisure, bonds, and money. If we choose these, we're going to get four first order conditions. And by choosing the optimal time path for these variables, we'll basically sort of by like deduction, by default, choose the optimal time path for consumption. Now, one more thing, aside from the fact that J.J. Abrams ruined Star Wars and Alex Kurtzman ruined Star Trek, we're taking derivatives and setting them equal to zero, and then we're solving for some stuff. And there's something I really want to cover, and it's the marginal utility of consumption. Now, that's the derivative of the utility function with respect to consumption. The marginal utility of current consumption is 1 over CT. Right, The natural log, you get the natural log of CT is utility of consumption. Well, the derivative of that is 1 over CT. The marginal utility of future consumption is beta times 1 over CT plus 1. So this beta is you know, how patient we are. Oh. And this 1 over CT plus 1 is just future consumption. So if you see either of these two, it's how utility changes given a change in consumption either today or tomorrow. So first order conditions. Well, we've got one for capital. Basically tells us how I give up consumption for buying capital goods to invest in the growth of a firm. It's going to be a function of this. Marginal utility of consumption today equals the marginal utility of future consumption multiplied by the interest rate plus 1 minus the rate of depreciation of capital how much basically borrowing capital pays, RT plus one, the real interest rate. However, we're also basically taking care of how much capital depreciates. If capital depreciates more, right, then the amount that we're actually gonna be able to consume tomorrow is actually gonna be a little bit lower. Labor and leisure. This is what determines whether or not we want to work or not work. Now, this is, this decision is going to be based on how much, uh, basically, how much we like work, theta, how much we want to consume, and what the wage rate is. Our third is going to be bonds. How much, how much consumption I'm willing to forego today to buy bonds that pay an interest rate R tomorrow. All right, this is going to tell me, okay, if I want to consume a bunch of stuff today, that's fine. But if the interest rate is pretty high, and the interest rate is higher than I am patient, then, well, maybe I don't want to consume as much stuff today. I can hold off. I can buy bonds because tomorrow I'm going to get all that money back plus the interest rate on whatever that was that I lent out. Mm -hmm. I get to consume more stuff. I get more money, right? 
I don't get as much money today, but I get more tomorrow, and that's good. And then finally, I've got money. How much consumption I'm willing to forego to be able to hold real money balances. Now, let's talk about capital. This is what's known as an Euler equation for capital. And this R sub T plus one is the marginal product of capital. Um, I made a little oopsie there. Ignore that, thus if it were what you saw before, it would be, just don't worry about that, don't pay attention to that. The Euler in this equation, basic, or the Euler model, or eh. <laughs> Uh, sound it out, Jeremy. The Euler equation in this model, there we go, says the household chooses to invest in capital up until the marginal utility of consumption today is equal to the marginal utility of consumption tomorrow, weighted by our time preferences and market conditions, as well as the rate of depreciation of fiscal capital. If interest rate goes up, we save more and consume less. It's basically the key takeaway. If the interest rate goes up, I consume less today because I'm saving more, but I get to consume more tomorrow. Key takeaway on that. Labor. This right here, this is our first order condition for labor. Now, the wage rate times the marginal utility of current consumption is equal to the elasticity of substitution of leisure for consumption divided by leisure. All right, basically it's an equilibrium condition which the agent's willing to work. If the agency's a high enough wage, they're going to prefer to just sit around and, uh, or if the agent sees a high enough wage, um, they will prefer to not sit on their asses, not sit on their asses. They'll prefer to work more, sit on their ass less, and be able to increase consumption. So that's a little oopsie there. This leads to the idea of a reserve wage. Now under a reserve wage, right, below this reserve wage, the agent doesn't want to work. But once we hit the reserve wage, they're automatically induced to want to work. So it's like, you need to pay me money to work, more or less. Think of it this way. All right, you got a cool job in like an office, make a lot of money, telling people what to do. All right, think like Wolf of Wall Street, right? If you're like one of those people in the office and you've got people under you, you're a boss, you get to tell people what to do with themselves. Um, maybe your job looks like this, right? Actually, you know what, let's hope it doesn't because uh, that, that's a great way to have a, have a uh, Mr. or Mrs. insert your name here. Please come see you know, the, the HR office at your earliest convenience and uh, make sure you bring all of your key cards and your laptops and any access into the building with you. Don't worry about why, we're just gonna have a little conversation. And then you go in there, they fire you, they take all your stuff and they boot you out because this is going to get everybody in a lot of trouble. Uh, so maybe it is like that, maybe it isn't, but I'm digressing. Now let's say you work in that office, your boss wants to give you a promotion. Now, promotion's kind of cool, right? Why isn't it? But it means you get more responsibility, right? You're responsible for more stuff. So if you're responsible for more stuff, and then stuff goes wrong on your watch, well, you're responsible for that. You're making more important decisions, which is cool, but if you screw up, the company suffers a lot more for it. If you screw up in your new job, piss your boss off, piss the company off, and that's just more stress and you know whatnot in your life. So are you gonna take the same wage as what you were earning before? Right? Let's say you're earning $100,000 a year and you're doing risk model validation at Western Alliance Bank. But then somebody goes, hey, we want to hire you, or we want to give you a promotion to have a management position as a risk model validation analyst, but you're still gonna make $100,000 a year. Now, $100,000 a year is $100,000 a year. It's not exactly, you know, bad money. If you're already earning that doing low level work, and they want you to do higher level work, um, what, no, I'm gonna keep my job where I am, thank you very much, I'm not moving up. They go, we're gonna give you $130,000 to do that. Okay, I would actually consider taking that. I'd probably do it. Um, but I want more money if that's gonna happen, right? That's kind of like what a reserve wage is. Another way to think of it is, if I ask one of you to help me grade exams, because I'm gonna be honest with you, grading exams is not my favorite thing in the world to do. If I'm gonna ask one of you to help me grade exams and I give you a dollar an hour, you're probably all going to tell me to, you know, go screw myself. And I would say that you are totally in the right for doing that. But if I offer you like 20 bucks an hour, 
you're probably going to be a little bit more likely to take it. Now, what's the wage rate that induces you to work? Well, it's somewhere between $1 and $20 an hour. Let's say it's $9, $10 an hour. Anything less than that, you don't want to work. Anything above that, you do want to work. That's a reserve wage. So let's rewrite that equation for labor to be basically the wage rate is a function of consumption, leisure, and the elasticity of substitution of leisure for consumption. It gives me this right here. The left-hand side of the equation is a reserve wage. The right-hand side of the equation is labor supply. In short, this household decides to supply labor based on the going wage rate, W, their preferences for leisure, and how much they want to consume. Now let's talk about bonds. It said this. Well, this basically is actually the same equation as the, uh, yeah, the Euler equation for capital. These are both Euler equations. And it means that we are either going to buy bonds or we're going to buy capital until the marginal utilities of consumption today and tomorrow are equal, weighted by our time preferences and the real interest rate. With a higher real interest rate, we're going to want to buy more bonds. Because if we buy more bonds, because we're getting a higher rate of interest, a higher rate of return, right? Well, we do that, then we don't get to consume as much today, but we get to consume a lot more tomorrow because we get the principal of the bond paid back plus the interest times the principal. One plus R times the principal of the bond. So the higher the real interest rate, excuse me, face is itchy, the more bonds you want to buy because they pay back more tomorrow so you can consume more stuff tomorrow. But it's dependent on how patient you are. The more patient you are, the more likely you'll be to buy bonds to consume more tomorrow. And this holds for both public and private bonds. Basically, the interest rate on public and private bonds is identical. Now money. This says the agent holds real money balances conditional on the marginal utilities of consumption weighted by time preferences, the inflation rate, and the elasticity of substitution between money holdings and consumption. In English, you're going to hold money until you're indifferent between holding money or consuming more stuff. This is a money demand function. This helps us determine an equilibrium in money markets. Now, this says money demands a function of inflation, preferences, and consumption. Now, go back to my earlier lectures on money demand, right? What was money demand a function of then? Think about what it was a function of and then look at this and see if you can try to figure out what's different, right? What's the same in this? What's different? And think about it. I'm actually probably going to put it on the problem set for you so you can think about it, you know, on the problem set. And uh, you'll also get some answers that way, which will probably, you know, help things. And kind of get your brain going. So the problem set for the household stuff is going to have stuff on money. It's going to have stuff on the labor supply. I'll get you to figure out like the reserve wage rate. And there's also going to be something about that Euler equation for bonds, that real interest rate, the way you want to hold off consumption, and sort of tying Milton Friedman's uh, rule for the optimal quantity of money into that. A um, little bit of math, some algebra, that's basically it. Uh, it's mostly just plug and chug, so it's not going to be too bad on you. But um, it's going to help you kind of solidify what some of these equations are, what they mean, and how we can actually use them in like a real world uh, scenario. So uh, let's, let's go ahead and recap. Household optimizes, we get important functions out of it. We get like capital supply, labor supply, demand for bonds, demand for money. Now this is only a part of the story because we need firms next. But fortunately for you, we're not doing firms in this lecture. We're going to do firms in the next lecture. So this week, basically, we're going to cover some of the optimization stuff for the household and firms. We're going to then go on to talk about uh, some of the implications of the model. We're going to talk about the static responses to shocks. We're going to look at dynamic responses to shocks. And then we're going to go on to the next model. There of course, be some problem sets along the way, discussions, fun things like that. But for now, we're done with the household section of the real business cycle model. So hopefully as I get right at 50 minutes even, I will end this video. And well, I guess I'm uh, five seconds over. Bye.